For those who don't know me, um, my name's Jeff Cowton. I'm the curator and head of learning at Wurzels Grasmere here, uh, a colleague of Hannah's. Um, and it is a real pleasure to welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to people who, as we've seen, are regulars, and particularly welcome to the people if this is your first time on, on one of our webinars. It, it's, it's really nice to, to have you with us. Um, a welcome to my co-host, uh, Dr. Joshua King, and a special welcome to Professor Fiona Sampson. Thank you, Fiona. Thanks very much for, for joining us tonight. It's, it's a great pleasure to see you again. I haven't seen you for a year or two. I think we should also give a real big welcome to the students too, the students of, of Baylor University. Um, it's really good that you've joined in. We've never done anything like this before. Never, I don't, well, I don't think we've had so many people on one of our webinars, Disparate Romantic, so this is really good. Um, we anticipate the event lasting about 75 minutes. Um, Josh and I shall say a few general words of introduction, followed by Fiona speaking about her new book, uh, Two-Way Mirror, The Life of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Josh will then introduce an exhibition created by his students at Baylor University, after which the students will have the opportunity to talk about their work and put a question to Fiona. And I'm really, really looking forward to that part of the evening as well. And the time will pass very quickly, I think we'll find. I'll introduce Fiona shortly, but first, just a word about the special friendship between Baylor University in Waco, Texas, and Words with Grasmere here at Dove Cottage. Um, people unfamiliar with Words with Grasmere, uh, well, we're in the northwest corner of England. Uh, we're based at William and Dorothy Wordsworth's home of Dove Cottage, where they lived between 1799 and 1808. And we're about, well, we're about to start the next big phase of our, of our existence, really. Um, we've spent a number of years reinterpreting, conserving, uh, town end. We've got a, a wonderful new museum. The cottage looks very different, and we hope all being well to open on the 17th of May. So, for those of you who can, we look forward to seeing you uh, on that date or, or very soon after. But it's always a great pleasure working with with Josh. Um, he's a associate professor in English at Baylor and the Margaret Root Brown Chair in Robert Browning and Victorian Studies. He's a first-rate scholar. I've heard him speak many times at conferences, and he's an excellent encourager and facilitator of students. And for years, Josh has been bringing groups of students, undergraduates and graduates to Grasmere, sometimes for two week courses that have explored words with poems in the immediate locality and have in turn led to displays and exhibitions in the museum uh, here too. I had the great pleasure of visiting Baylor. I have, to, I have to mention this, I'm sorry, it's a personal note, but I had the great pleasure of visiting Baylor in 2014. I was made very welcome. Um, I was there as it happened for the homecoming pep rally night. I mean, it wasn't planned this way, but it was the biggest bonfire I've ever seen in my life. Um, and I also got to visit the Baylor Bears. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that must be a basketball team. And it may well be, but the ones I saw were the real Bears uh, on site on the campus. So that, that was unforgettable too. And I, what was also unforgettable was that I saw the, the collection at the Armstrong Browning Library, which, uh, as well as including the Brownies, of course, did have one or two words with treasures that were, were put out for me, and uh, I appreciated that too. So most recently, um, Josh has invited me to share my experience of exhibition interpretation with his students, creating exhibitions focused on the Brownings and the library collections. And I particularly enjoyed the present group's exhibition, a display which we all feel is, is worthy of a wider attention and a wider audience. So, so when Fiona suggested that we have an event on, on Elizabeth Barrett Browning, this just seemed the ideal moment to bring these two things together. Um, so we're gonna, as I say, we'll hear from the students and their exhibition and they'll have the opportunity to ask Fiona questions. And maybe Fiona, you might have the opportunity to comment on the exhibition as, as we go through as well. So I think this is the moment maybe um, to hand over to Josh. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. And you speak of feeling welcomed at Baylor. And uh, since 2012, when I first brought a group of students your way to Grasmere, you've made me and many students feel welcome or home at Grasmere. So I'm grateful too for how our collaboration has benefited students right here on campus. Uh, you might not think of Central Texas as the first location, uh, as the first place that comes to mind when you think where is the largest collection of items in one single place related to Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, but it is here on Baylor's campus in the Armstrong Browning Library. Uh, um, students often when they come to campus are not yet aware of that themselves. They'll be familiar in their first couple years with the stained glass windows and the nice rooms for study at the Armstrong Browning Library Museum. 
but they're always slightly amazed when they learn that they can access over 50,000 rare manuscripts and letters, books, all sorts of odds and ends related to the Brownings, and then also a great many other 19th century writers and figures. I always get a little bit of a kick of handing them a letter and then they discover that it's Queen Victoria's <laughs> that they're holding. Um, and since 2017, as Jeff has mentioned, students in my classes have worked together to create four exhibitions, both physical, so in the museum and the library itself, and then also online and trying to reach the public with that. And most recently this exhibit, the online exhibit, the Brownings in Our World has come out of that work together with students. It's been so exciting to do that with them. And I think anybody who does an exhibition realizes that it is a challenge. How do you take all that you possibly might say, all that you've learned and distill it into just a few words in a small space to reach somebody you've never met and who might have no prior interest or reason to care? <laughs> it's a pretty tall order, I think, for any person. And so we've been especially grateful to have the help and the wise advice of Jeff, who, as he mentioned, has beamed in several times over the years to students um, through virtual meetings and conversations about engaging the public with uh, rare, old, dusty things and making them interesting, <laughs> and um, has also generously joined us at the end of semesters when we've displayed the exhibits. Uh, I have very fond memories of carrying Jeff around on my phone <laughs> as he talked with each student at their station in the exhibition room and, uh, and gave his thoughts as they shared with him the fruit of the work that he had helped to advise. So it's especially a real pleasure and honor to be together with Jeff and with all of you today, and especially with our students who we'll be hearing from soon. Um, Fiona, I want to say to you, as Jeff has noted, we thought it would be such an exciting opportunity to involve you in the conversation with some students who've worked on this exhibition, which does highlight Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And we're especially honored to hear from you about your new biography on EBB. Well, thank you very much, um, Josh, or I'm not really sure whether I should be calling you Dr. King or Professor King, but I'll kind of call you Josh and um, assume the, the assume the honor of fix because it is a delight to be here. And um, one of the reasons it's a delight is because uh, the Armstrong Library is, is for me, as for anybody who's done work on either of the Brownings, obviously the kind of um, ne plus ultra. And for me, it's, a, it's an archive of the mind because I haven't been there. <laughs> um, you know, the pandemic has come when it's come, and while I while I was working on the book, and um, obviously to some extent, uh, the the library already has a wonderful presence. I mean, a, a fantastically rich blog presence. I mean, which is obviously a kind of permanent blog, as well as now your you know the curatorial work of the students kind of coming online, as well as being in the flesh, um, and of course, you know, there's the the Browning Letters, the Browning Correspondence curated by Philip Kelly, which is just an, um, an astonishing mountain of archival achievement and uh, is a joy. I mean, it, it, you know, it's an extraordinary thing. It really does shrink the world. You know, I really didn't have to get on a plane to, um, to kind of come and look at the letters. And although artifacts, as I'm sure we'll, one of the things we'll talk about is the, the kind of touchstone quality of the artifacts themselves, as you're saying, the Queen Victoria letter. There is certainly for the researcher, when you're kind of, as it were, loving the touchstones, but trying to move beyond them to storytell, as it were, or think with them, there is something very useful about not having the beautiful object, but having something that you can keep in your laptop, you know, that is just on screen. You can go back to it and back to it and back to it. You're not having to disturb an archivist or a curator and say, look, can I just go back to that display case? Can I just have the white gloves again? You know, it's just, there's a kind of hands-on dirtiness to digital work, which is, which is really, which is a compliment to the, to the concrete um, actuality of, um, of the of the originals, by which I'm incredibly moved, as I suspect we all are. It was a great pleasure working with Jeff on the um, the summer exhibition at the Grasmere at Wordsworth Grasmere for Mary Shelley's bicentenary a couple of well now nearly three years ago. I mean, when I say worked on, frankly, 
Jeff did all the work, but uh, but it was a joy to have the conversations and um, and to s- sort of be party to his thinking about how you tell a different story about Mary Shelley, um, mm. which brings me really to talking about telling a story about Elizabeth Barrett Browning because you know I know that one of the things that you know you were hoping I might talk about a little bit is why write a book about. Um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and I think I should show you the beautiful UK edition. The um, the Norton edition is beautiful in the States. It's beautiful. It's not out yet. It's beautiful in a different way. They are both beautiful books. I'm so lucky. Um, why write about Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Well, partly because why write about Mary Shelley? And to go one step back, that sense in both cases of how you thread between the things that we all know, or we hope that everybody knows, about the objects of our enthusiasm and how without gimmickry or fictionalizing or being finally too tangential, you bring something new to the the virtual table where the discussion about these figures is going on. And so, a lot of my thinking about Elizabeth Barrett Browning has been colored by having been very recently thinking about Mary Shelley. They were born only nine years apart and yet they belong to such different worlds. Um, Mary Shelley, you know, born Mary Godwin, the daughter of radicals of, of soi disant intellectuals at the cutting edge of culture and thought formation, an echt romantic, famously, obviously, eventually married, <laughs> the romantic purpose with Shelley. Um, and for a long time, and it is still in British mainstream culture, remains slightly inaudible, and there remains a tendency to appropriate her most famous book, obviously, Frankenstein, and take it into a kind of domain which is has not to do with her authorship. Um, a domain which has to do with perhaps James Ware, the 1931 movie, or much worse, in my opinion, a fantasy that really her husband wrote the book. And you can hear where I'm going with this, can't you? In in that there is something of the same territory one discovers in Elizabeth Barrett Browning's adult life, a reception of her work as increasingly marginal and of her and a, and a kind of invert chronological inversion in which she is seen as having learnt from the pioneer Robert Browning whereas in fact chronologically speaking wherever Robert went with what I would call their shared poetics particularly after Elizabeth Barrett Browning's death um and he did go to some amazing places. Nevertheless, those that common poetics sprang from Elizabeth's own pioneering writing, I would argue, not from Robert's. And it has proved enormously difficult to, in fact, impossible to persuade any mainstream British publisher to publish an authoritative contemporary reader's version of uh, Elizabeth's work to go alongside the biography. Um, shocking at a time when much more minor figures like Charlotte Mew are being kind of, you know, ex, exhumed from the historical vault and, you know, advocated as poets. And I think that this is because unconsciously there is still a sense that um, there's still a sense of the diminutive of the poetess. That's to say, there's still a sense that our canonical um, and historical women writers, particularly poets, are. Um, and should be somehow minor figures. So it's honourable to do work on a figure like Charlotte Mew, which says, you know, celebrates her minor poet status, but there is something controversial and faintly tedious about readdressing Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who was a major literary figure, hugely influential on her generation and on generations you know, who followed her. 
So that is a kind of cloud of knowing or unknowing around Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And I guess that it would be useful to just rattle through, you know, some conceptual structures, some, like some dates, not obviously for Baylor students or for the specialists who are um, very much the audience for this um, webinar, but because Elizabeth is in many ways so forgotten. So she was born in 1806. She was born the daughter and granddaughter of um, slavers in Jamaica, something which um, only gradually became, began to trouble her, but troubled her greatly in adulthood. And she became an active campaigner for abolition. She was extraordinarily precocious. She was writing plays in French when she was eight, nine. Um, her first book, Okay, it was vanity published by her father, but nevertheless, it stands the test of time and was published for her 14th birthday. So in other words, she completed it when she was 13. When she was 15, she was laid low rather famously by what I think the evidence quite clearly points to as a post-viral, a viral and then post-viral syndrome from which she never fully recovered, although she had periods of relative health in her life. She remained at home, as did all her um, 10 surviving siblings. There were 12 kids in all. Um, after their mother's death in an increasingly autocratic household where her father, who had had difficulties of own, which we can go into, um, gradually it became apparent he didn't want any of his children to leave home and marry. Um, the three who did were disowned. Elizabeth was the first of them to do so because when she was 40, attracted by her, um, her work, by her latest collection of poems, Robert Browning, who had been aware of her work and who was six years younger than her, um, sent her a fan letter and started uh, a year of visits and correspondence, which led to a secret marriage and very quite famously there running away together, you can't say eloping because they were married, to Italy, where Elizabeth's health improved. She had a much more a kind of classic writer's life with the literary salons, was highly sociable, um, and became incredibly involved in um, Italian politics and became an advocate for um, Italian reunification and um, the end of Habsburg rule in Italy. And as a result, when she died in 1861, was given a heroine's funeral by the citizens of, well, by the, by the Celts, you know, the, the ruling burghers of, of, of Florence. So she is a figure whose private life has unfortunately been pushed to the fore by Rudolf Bézier's um, The Barracks of Wimpole Street. There are many problems with that, not least that she only lived in Wimpole Street for fewer than six years in total, but also because it is a story which um, was so successful, I mean, you know, three movies, seven made for TV films, um, twice a Broadway hit, that it um, has moved into popular culture. And just as in a sense the James Whale Frankenstein has moved into popular culture ahead of the figure of Mary Shelley. So Rudolf Bézier's swooning poetess on her couch with the kind of warring figures of these masculine principles, her lover and her father, um, has stepped in front of the real Elizabeth Bat Browning, who on the contrary was extremely tough, survived living with chronic, you know, life-threatening, disabling illness, it was largely an autodidact within certain parameters, um, was fiercely determined to become a writer against a poet, against the grain of social expectation, was determined to be the greatest woman poet and as good as Homer, and largely made her dreams come true and who was a political activist. Uh, I said that she, she was an abolitionist. So she wrote famously The Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point, which is still, I mean, a really blood curdling and very moving poem, which, which imagines the kind of excess, the kind of Baroque excess of brutality. I mean, rape basically, that can go alongside with enslavement, doesn't have any notion of enslavement as a kind of economic necessity or any such fantasy. Um, sees it as absolutely written on the body, um, which she not only writes, but um, gives, donates to an abolitionist magazine. In other words, to help with the cause in a very practical way. She writes The Cry of the Children Against Child Indentured Labour in British Factories. She changes 
British popular opinion, um, I mean, not only about the, the child labor, where she really did contribute, but um, about, um, about Italian independence, um, both through Casa Guidi windows and also later, a later collection, Poems Before Congress, which is her last um, collection before her posthumous poems. Two book lengths, although Casa Guidi Windows is one long poem, not that long, um, interventions which spoke to the to Middle England really and to the mainstream readership that she was addressing um, in all her work and shifted popular opinion. So something that was kind of foreign and not very interesting became something that you know Brits might become sentimental about, might attach themselves to. So she was she was very politically engaged. Um, and she was also an extraordinary mirror of her times. I said earlier that, um, you know, she kind of devised this poetics that she and Robert made so much of. And it, she was very much with Tennyson the, at the forefront of the shift from kind of abstraction and the poet as kind of going ahead of, of the exception of the kind of intellectual and sensitive elite to the radical, to the poet as speaking to Hearth and Home, the new wider reach shit that was coming in with the with blossoming, really burgeoning. I mean, we think of it with Dickens. You know, we think of Dickens' readers mobbing the newsstands to see the next instalment of, you know, uh, whatever, whichever, whichever novel. But we forget that, of course, poetry was then. Um, had a mass readership and that Elizabeth was also publishing in the same periodicals as well as in books and she was addressing this new a twofold sudden growth in readership the new emerging middle class of the kind of the Clark's class as it were the white collar class and much increased literacy as gradually um, education for everybody became first a kind of charitable cause that was suddenly very much taken up and Elizabeth's own family, she, her sister Arabella was very involved with ragged schools and so it was a chat and, and they were was very religious, was a descent that was very non-conformist religious which is where a lot of the energy for this came from but also became then a governmental thing. Um, so and Elizabeth who from her childhood having been encouraged by this controversial figure her father from early childhood to be a poet always had this association with hearth and home for her poetry. And so she was not afraid to, rather than being kind of the, the exceptional individual out on, on the crag, to be very much writing to the folks back home, and which means that she captured the zeitgeist and was able to shift it. So what we read as perhaps a little sentimental quite narrative in a way that goes in and out of fashion and is less timeless than some of the romantic poetry is nevertheless some one of the springs of Elizabeth's great affect and great effectiveness. She, um, I think two key things that um, for me really kind of characterize importance and with these I will shut up. <laughs> one is that she believed from the early stage and was explicit about it in the ethical uses of poetry. She saw poetry as instrumental. It was the illustration of abstraction to make it more comprehensible and engaging in order to engage and change the reader or the readership, so the individual and society. And the other thing that she did was she wrote partly as a function of this, um, but also partly as this whole part of the trajectory of this whole absolutely willed self-invention of herself as a writer. She wrote Aurora Lee, which is her masterpiece, really, when she was 50. And Aurora Lee is the first, first buildings romance. So the first story of how a self becomes that was written by a woman not only with a female protagonist, but by a woman. And it's also the first Kunstler romance. So the first story of how an artist, a maker becomes. And it's of course the story of how Aurora Lee, who is and isn't Elizabeth Barrett Browning, very, very different life. So the whole fictional structure is different, becomes a poet. How, despite the opposition of above all, 
you know, her soulmate, the man she loves, the man she ends up with, who's a very good man, she becomes that extraordinary thing, a woman poet. And because of that, that book was greatly admired for decades after Elizabeth's death, as well as being a bestseller in her lifetime. And, you know, her admirers included people like Hans Christian Andersen, but the book was admired by Ruskin, by Oscar Wilde, by Virginia Woolf, although Woolf was ambivalent about Elizabeth Barrett Browning, very much by Emily Dickinson, on whom she was a huge influence. Aurora Lee is a great sort of unfurling as a flag of permission giving for women writers. And it accepts not that women writers should write in a different tradition, but that women's, women writers have a different set of difficulties in getting to the desk or the stage, however, or the page, however you want to picture the moment of arrival at writing. And for that, I think that we all continue to owe her. And I also think for that, we need to keep although we shouldn't, and it's sad that we do, need to keep retelling her story and Aurora Lee's story. So that's, from my point of view, what I was trying to do in my book. I was trying to be a storyteller about this amazing story, um, just as Elizabeth herself was. Well, I, I think that emphasis upon storytelling and uh, a double movement that I think you helped us perform of trying to understand Elizabeth very much in her own time and the particular struggles that she faced as a woman and as a writer makes her suddenly all the more present to us now. So then going back, she comes forward. <laughs> and, yeah, um, thank you. I mean, I think that that's what biography does. I mean, one of the, um, one of the reasons that my book is called Two-Way Mirror is not only because I think there's a two-way mirror aspect to Aurora Lee and Elizabeth, as it were, you know, the two-way mirror is a mirror where there's a blacked out back to it, but actually people beyond the mirror can look through it to the, to as it were, the people in the interrogation room or, or I write about it in a clinical setting. Um, but I also think it's what biography does that, you know, we, we, we try, we try to be portraitists and, you know, if you think about a portrait, the subject of the portrait is looking out of the frame. But of course, they're not meeting our eyes because really we're not meeting their eyes. We, we, aren't, we aren't there in that moment when the portrait was made and they can't, they can't answer back to us. They can't get us to change our version. We scrutinize, we frame, we look, and they can't look back. But I think that looking through Aurora Lee to Elizabeth is a really interesting and intimate way to read her. Yes, much agreed. And I'm very eager to see the type of conversation and connections that will emerge between the richness of what you've brought to us in the biography of Elizabeth and the double glance <laughs> that your two-way mirror offers us. Um, and also what the students have begun to discover too through their exhibition as they went into the archives and through connections between what they found, her life, and then the present. Um, so maybe what I can do is share just a few words about the exhibition, and then we'll have, a, I think, a very lively conversation all together. Um, so one question that the students with us today asked and as part of a class this last semester in fall 2020, which is, was this, and it's pretty simple, but it's a hard one to answer well which is how do the Brownings and the rare things that are collected and next, you know, related to them on campus speak to our world now? So in what way can they still have great relevance for us? So we asked this in the class in a number of different ways in the actual sessions and in the readings we were doing, but also through working on this exhibition together. And as no one needs to be reminded, this has been an unusually difficult time for teachers and students around our world uh, during the pandemic. And so, of course, this was worked out uh, through unusual challenges. We had to do this in a hybrid environment in which half of the students were online and couldn't physically access items. So there's a lot of scanning and photography involved, um, a lot of collaboration across the virtual medium. But through their great creativity and determination and just willingness to experiment with the first born digital exhibition that I've been part of myself, um, 
the students put together something that I think is really impressive and engaging. And I think it will be helpful just to give you a quick preview of it. And what we'll do is I'm going to be pulling up the exhibit, the exhibition online um, up on the screen and give you a, a short intro into it. And then we're going to have each student um, who's present with us today, who is able to join us today, um, share a little bit about their exhibit and ask a question of Fiona and we'll have a dialogue uh, with one another. So um, your patience as I just get this on the screen, there's always that interesting transition moment. So here it comes. You should be able to see the main landing page of the exhibition of the Brownings in our world. Um, this is a plaster casting of the Brownings hands that the students became very interested in as a symbol of what they discovered together by thinking about the intertwined lives and creativity of the Brownings. Uh, it was done by a friend of theirs, the American sculptor, Harriet Hosmer, and then became the basis of a bronze casting that, um, of which there are several copies, the Armstrong Brown Library has one. Um, so they became fascinated with that symbol, as it were, of the two main figures. The, what they decided to do was to explore the lives and works of the Brownings through three dominant themes, injustice, nature, and faith, and these were also important to our discussions. And a main contention that the students had is that although the Brownings are in so many ways distinct from us, their eyes don't meet us, as Fiona reminded us. Nonetheless, there are so many ways in which their works and their lives continue to be uh, relevant, speak to us now, and challenge us. And so they invite us through the exhibition to have that type of encounter with the Brownings. I'll give you just a little peek at what it looks like and how it works, and then we'll get right into what the students want to share with us. So let me give you just an example of how it works. So at the top, there are the three main uh, themes and you can click on those. And so if I were to click on this, for example, relating to nature, it would take me to that section of the ex exhibition. And then there are exhibits you can click on from there. I'll share just one as an example that um, students won't be talking about today just so you can see it and then not tread on their toes as they share about theirs. Um, Here's one from the nature section of the exhibition. And at the top will always be an image that in some way the student felt related to their subject of what they were bringing out about the poet, in this case, Elizabeth. Um, and then the viewer can click that image and have a video introduction to the exhibit from the student talking about what they found to be important. Uh, this one was by uh, Peyton Robinson, uh, another student in the class who wasn't able to join us today, but. Um, like all the students did a beautiful job with her page. And then um, you'll be able to engage a main item on the left uh, that relates to a narrative that the student writes about it. And then at the bottom, a couple more items that they found were relevant to their subject and some engaging um, captions under each. And in case like me, you sometimes have hard time seeing small print on a screen at the, or small images on a screen at the bottom, that you can also engage with the items in a more uh, interactive way, in a larger scale by clicking through a gallery. So those are just some of the ways that the pages work. One last thing that you might be interested in as you navigate the um, exhibition, if you decide to visit it afterwards, is there's an exhibition timeline and map that the students created in a digital form. So it will take you to, for example, a map that, that places in the world each of the items and, and, and things that they found interesting in their exhibit. Um, so you can click on it and see, for example, where it was that Robert and Elizabeth went and felched a leaf from Byron's garden <laughs> as they, uh, where he had stayed, that is, um, as they visited Pisa. Um, and then go through a timeline that connects aspects of the exhibition to moments in time, um, important both to the Brownings and to each of the exhibit uh, pieces just to help you pull together the many things you might be seeing as you go through it. So I think you'll agree, the students I think were just really so creative in the way they approach this. Um, what I'd like us to do is I'm going to introduce the students one by one and we'll let them share a few words about their um, exhibit and also ask a question of Fiona. So we'll go ahead and we're gonna to go to the first um, unit of the exhibition, Power and Injustice. And uh, 
look at this exhibit on Elizabeth struggling to express herself in a disapproving society, a theme that ties in nicely with many things that uh, Professor Sampson Fiona was mentioning. Um, this is by Bridget uh, Tragoyan. And so Bridget, I'm going to invite you to share a few words about this with us and I will scroll down to places you might want to emphasize as you talk. All right, hello, my name is Bridget. Um, my section titled Elizabeth struggling to express herself in a disapproving society is about gender roles at the time that Elizabeth was living um, and just about the things that women were and were not allowed to do as well as just the limitations that were placed on the things they produced and said in the public eye. Um, the time that I talk about in Elizabeth's life is a time where she was feeling a lot of strong emotions. She was being courted, courted by Robert, so she was feeling a lot of love for him, but also grief over her brother who had just recently passed away and not to mention her declining health. Um, but from this time came one of her greatest works, the sonnets from the Portuguese. And she initially published this under the facade that she was just translating the words that were being said in the poems um, in an attempt to kind of hide the fact that these were her true thoughts and feelings. Um, and so the artifacts that I worked with were early drafts of Sonnet 5 from Sonnet to the Portuguese and also her poem, Past and Future. Um, and I just think that this was all really important because it allowed us to see how far women have come and um, in terms of what society allows us to say and what we can produce. And it allows us to be grateful for how far we've come, but also is able to inspire us to do more, to keep going. Um, and so the question I wanted to ask was, what sort of audience did you imagine yourself addressing when you wrote? And who do you think will, or who do you hope will read it and be affected by it? Oh, thank you, Fidget. What an interesting question, but also what an interesting, how interesting to take sonnets from the Portuguese as, um, as your exemplar for um, Elizabeth writing against the grain, because of course, you know, they are, they were, they were in effect confessional poetry. I mean, they were written about Robert, but she knew that Robert disapproved of confessional poetry. And so, which is one of the reasons she didn't show him the poems until quite some time after they were married. And you're absolutely right that, you know, the, they were originally going to be called sonnets from the Bosnian. <laughs> um, but the Portuguese is, a, you know, an allusion to this kind of tradition of the letters from the Portuguese nun, this notion of the kind of the literary trope. Uh, that was a particular text that was in, still a bestseller when um, Elizabeth and Robert were, you know, writing and working. But you know, as um, uh, as, a, as a whole tradition about um, the sort of slightly risque, um, but romantic love poems supposed to be letters supposed to be written by a Portuguese nun. I mean, who knows whether it's a literary fake or not? So there's a kind of illusion to that. Um, and so, in a sense, of all Elizabeth's poems, and um, going against the grain of what I was was saying earlier. These were poems that were in a way written without an audience, without a destination, without a kind of sense of obligation and engagement. They were in a sense a more makerly, and I want to say abstract exercise. That's to say they were as, you know, one of the things that we poets often talk about is the sense of writing a poem as um, kind of transcribing from, well, from what? Not from life, not quite from the unconscious, but a sense of givenness that always happens, you know, when, when writing's going well, it happens in researcher's luck and so on when, you, when you're studying. Um, so these are the poems, this sonnet sequence are the poems in which Elizabeth is most purely doing that. She's at her least responsible. And I think that actually retaining some sense of that, even in aside, whatever you've been, your commission you've been given as a writer is essential. It is the, it isn't that writing is, literary writing is 
self-expression. It's not that at all, but that it, it is that it has a, it must have a kind of truth to what you really think. You have to be thinking with every word. You have to continue to do the difficult thing rather than an assent to a formula that you've been given by a publisher. Um, and it's easy for me to say, oh, Elizabeth Brett Browning was, is this, that, or the other, because it is a book that I pitched to my publishers. Whereas Mary Shelley, they came to me and said, what would you, you know, we need something for the Frankenstein Bicentenary 2018, what can you write? Because you've, because I had done, um, there's, there's a series published by Fabers here of contemporary poets making readers editions of canonical poets and I'd done Percy Bysshe Shelley. And so bizarrely, I came to Mary Shelley through Percy. Um, so, I felt when I was writing Mary Shelley that I was very much having a conversation with other biographers. Just as when I'm writing poetry, I think I'm having a conversation with all the poems that have, have ever been written. Um, and with Elizabeth Barrett Browning, there was less of a sense of that conversation because there hasn't been another full length biography, solo biography of Elizabeth since the 1980s. So, you know, and certainly an enormous amount more archiving and so on has been done since, since that biography. So I didn't feel I was having a conversation with other biographers. I felt much more lonely, much more as though I was kind of going out and um, being a lone voice in a sense, an advocate. I think, I believe very much in scholarly work, obviously. Um, you know, I'm a scholar, but for me, a literary biography the history, the scholarliness, the research is only the first stage. Then you have to, I mean, it's a bit like literary criticism, you know, you close read the poem, you have to close read the evidence and you have to come to conclusions. That's the second stage. And the third stage is you have to make something that is desirable to read. You have to seduce a readership who, I would like it to be a general readership. I'd like it to be a general literary readership. I'd like my scholarship to be impeccable and I'd like to contribute to EBB scholarship with insights and with collating of facts, but I would like to be addressing the general readership, not necessarily a domestic one in the EBB sense, but a general readership because I think that that's where my subject belongs. I think that's where Elizabeth belongs. And I think that to do less than that, you know, with this kind of book would be to fail her. So it's a really weird thing. It's kind of to your own inner compass be true, but at the same time, you seduce the reader, you take them along with you. Thank you, Fiona. That was um, a wonderful response and an insight into the multiple tensions and ambitions that are navigated in a biography of this kind, as you think about the audience and addressing them. Um, we'll go to a, another, entry from Power and Justice, also dealing in some ways with navigating tensions. Um, this is called Complicit Activism, and it is by Caitlin Consular. And so Caitlin, I'm going to invite you to come on and say a few words about your piece, and I will also help you scroll down as you talk. <laughs> Caitlin, um, so nice to be on the panel today. So yeah, my, my topic is complicit activism. And I was basically just kind of talking about what um, Dr. Sampson touched on earlier with, you know, Elizabeth did come from this slave owning family. She did have an inheritance that came um, from the work of slaves. But at the same time, she was very much an activist and she very much disapproved of slavery and wanted to do everything that she could to stop this practice. So she wrote this poem, The Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point, which was, you know, huge, a hugely influential um, piece, piece of work. And kind of, I wanted to connect this to our society today, because I still feel like this is a very relevant topic. And I know that typically when we think about this kind of thing, in today's terms, we think about race, which is certainly a huge issue, but slavery today is still very much a huge issue. Um, the estimates range from about 38 million slaves today to 46 million slaves. And there's this, you know, online website that, um, that Dr. Keen had showed us called Slavery Footprint, 
where you can take a quiz that will estimate the number of slaves that you that have that are working for you. Um, and the average score, I think, is around 25. And so I think that this is a very relevant topic that oftentimes we don't we don't think about how slavery is still in existence today. But even today, we are complicit in slavery. Um, I'm sure that it's very unlikely that anyone who is is on this Zoom call today does not have something in their home that was made partially uh, through slave work. And it's hard to avoid, it's hard to know what you know those items are, but this is still a huge reality today. And so the, the question that I wanted to ask you was, how do you feel the runaway slave at Pilgrim's Point speaks to our society today, whether that's through slavery, whether that's um, through issues of race, what would you say is kind of your your take on how that poem really speaks to our present time? Mm, thank you so much, Caitlin, and thank you so much for the for your piece because you're absolutely right. I think that it's so easy, so facile to look at, back and say, "Oh, you know, Elizabeth Bat Browning was a beneficiary of slavery," which she was, and indeed so was Robert. Um, and oh, you know, we couldn't be like that today. But as you rightly say, we we are in the West. We are all the beneficiaries of slavery, and 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 in two ways. That's to say, there is, you know, something we're very conscious of in Britain is that the you know the spoils of empire. That you know the 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 what the old world, Europe, looted from the rest of the world in terms of resources and in terms of human resources, I mean, leaving aside atrocity and so on, is so enormous and we've never paid reparations. So of course we have nice cozy economies now compared to other parts of the world. And then as you say, slavery is a modern day reality. And I think that, I love your phrase, complicit activism, it's just fantastic because I think that's the point. We are all positioned in within implication. We are all implicated. And um, I think that if you are white, you are more implicated, but I think that we are all locked inside this implication. And that really helps us think about Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her choices, because, you know, she didn't walk away from her inheritance, but to do so would have been, there was no welfare state, there was no safety net, would have been literally to become penniless and to, to die. I mean, to be, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just a kind of a social loss. She would have been absolutely, she'd been on the streets. And that was true for everyone around her. You know, none of them gave up their wealth um, because it was kind of unthinkable. The costs that we are asking them retrospectively to have paid are much greater than we are prepared to do ourselves. That is not to say that her guilt and her complicity is not there, but it is to understand that what you can do is be activist from wherever you are located within that implication. And I think that that is the lesson she tells us, she, she teaches us. I think that runaway slave is uh, particularly, I mean, it's such a, such a strong poem and so, I mean, so many things. One of the things is it is absolutely brilliant. It has this strategy of subverting the convention by which, uh, by which she would have been surrounded, the convention of black is bad, white is good. For her in the poem, for the narrator of the poem, the speaker of the poem, everything white is, is a horror. You know, her child is born and the child is relatively white because he, he she is a result of rape um, by a white person so there's that kind of inversion there is um the sense that again the sense of implication because there is no the enslaved woman who has been raped is not compassionate towards her child she kills her child um so she is not a sort of saintly abstraction she is also caught up in this flawed network of power structures and relationships. And then, as I was saying earlier, you know, that it is because it is about rape and then, and then the woman 
is flogged to death because she has killed the child of the rape. You know, the, it's so untidy, so not convenient. It's, it's such an inconvenient truth. You know, it's so inconvenient that, you know, you can't just say, oh, those are the baddies over there. They've got a different uniform. They're different from us. You know, it, 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 it locates us inside that, that nexus, um, which is where we are located. So I think that, um, yes, I think your, I think your, I think your title is absolutely brilliant, and I would like to steal it, but I won't. Um, but I think that it, it absolutely speaks for what we should learn, what we should let Elizabeth's poem and her life teach us about our own complicity and activism. Well, thank you. And um, yes, I think, uh, uh, Caitlin, you do place us in a way with these objects and with Elizabeth and Runaway Slave that certainly does not let us off the hook in our own moment. And I think it's absolutely appropriate. Um, so let me take us to another fascinating exhibit also dealing with some of the moral ambiguity that uh, uh, Fiona was mentioning. This is the moral ambiguity of anti-slavery and how Elizabeth and Robert Browning were profiting from slavery revealing the dubious ethics of early anti-slavery movements, or at least some of the complications of them. So this is by Alexis Basso, and I'm going to invite her to come on uh, for us and share a little bit about your exhibit, Alexis. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name is Alexis Basso, um, and I'll actually, yeah, I'll be piggybacking off of Caitlin and discussing my own analysis of the runaway slave at Pilgrim's Point but also more importantly, the moral ambiguity that I feel that the poem presents. So for context, you know, Elizabeth wrote it from the perspective of a female slave where she's had to endure incredible violence, um, been beaten, raped, impregnated by her slave master, you know, debates, killing the child so that the baby won't have to endure the same circumstances that she has, which is a decision she ultimately makes. And as I was reading this, I was like, this is so incredibly dark and grim and graphic but um, something that continued to filter through my mind was, um, did Elizabeth have the authority as a white woman who has never had to endure these circumstances at all, have the authority to write from the perspective of a slave? And also, did she have the authority when her family herself profited off of the practice? So if you scroll to the bottom of my exhibition, I actually have pictured um, the Cinnamon Hill Plantation in Jamaica which was the Moulton Barrett familial plantation that was actually very profitable. Um, and Elizabeth even used the funds from this plantation to um, flee to Florence, Italy after she secretly married Robert. Um, and so I was just curious, you know, does her profiting off slavery taint a lot of the depth and meaning from this poem? But on the flip side, did this poem give a voice to black slaves during this time period? If a runaway slave had actually written this poem, it most likely never would have been published or even discarded. Um, it let, never would have been published in the Liberty Bell, which is where it ultimately was published. So did Elizabeth, by using her voice, even though she did profit off of it, was it giving a voice to the voiceless during this time period? And so the whole purpose of my exhibition, I just wanted to, I didn't wanna give a concrete answer. I just wanted to present the different moral dilemmas that were possible from this poem and just let the audience decide for themselves what they thought and whether or not Elizabeth was qualified and or justified in writing this poem. So my question for Professor Sampson was, do you think the ideas presented in this exhibition reflect some of what you've discovered about Elizabeth Barrett Browning yourself? Mm. Thank you, Alexis. Of course, I, I do want to ask you um, what your, con your, your personal conclusion is, not it's great that you left the, you know, what you curated open because that's absolutely right, you know. But but do do you have a have you come to a position about whether she had the moral authority? Uh, maybe not. I, I I'm really torn because I always thought, you know, she did profit off of it, so that's a huge red flag. But she wasn't complicit. She wanted to change her ways, and it was a great. Um, way to push a different agenda of, you know, like, it's not a great thing, you know, at all, <laughs> during a time when people were very, very much for slavery. And so I go, well, you know, she did, but she also helped a lot of people understand the violence behind this. And so that I think that's where I stand. So she might not have been qualified, but I think it was 
an important poem, even if she did profit off of it. Mm, thank you very much, Alexis. Yes, I mean, I agree. I mean, you know, there's in psychoanalysis a, a concept of kind of good enough, a good enough mother. Um, you know, I think there may be a concept of a good enough citizen within the context of global global context of slavery. I mean, of course, the flip side of that is the terrible risk of complacency. And possibly we can never allow our own selves that status, but perhaps we can allow sometimes the objects of our study that status. Um, I think that it's a very interesting question um, about you know, her moral authority uh, and whether you know, she had the authority to write such a poem. Because of course, it's a question about who can say what in literature. I mean, several things spring to mind really. One is the notion of, um, you know, Theodore Adorno who said, um, no lyric poetry after Auschwitz, you know, the sense that some horrors and obviously slavery would be one of them are so absolute that you can't make pretty art from them. I, I paraphrase. Um, but this is not pretty art. You know, it is fully inhabited. It's not just polemic. It's a work of literature, but it is, its heart is absolutely in the right place, so to speak. Then there's a question about um, the literary imagination, about empathy, about stepping beyond the boundaries of the self. You know, what, what, what role a moral imagination if we can't ever try and put ourselves in someone else's shoes? At the moment, the way that we tend as a society in Britain and North America to think about this is to say, we can't ever successfully put ourselves in someone else's shoes. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't speak for them. And that obviously has a tremendous ring of authority and truth, but then what price the imagination? How do we ever empathize? You know, is there a, a kind of, we can put ourselves in someone else's shoes providing we don't condemn them or belittle them? Is there a kind of partial kind of moral permission giving? And then there's another, that's, and then there's another set of questions. Well, what is the moral status of literature? Should it always, as Elizabeth thought, be have moral integrity? You know, what about, what do I think? I mean, I've just reviewed, you know, the new biography of Philip Roth. I mean, I have massive problems with Roth's relationship with women. I mean, in his life, it turns out, as well as in his novels. But I think his novels are fantastic because they get inside that mindset. Of course, he's not making an imaginative leap because he's getting inside his own mindset. He's failing to make an imaginative leap into the woman's mindset. Had he done so, maybe there would have been a little bit more kind of respect for women or a kind of more three-dimensionality for his women characters. So by that analogy, maybe it's good to try and make the imaginative leap, even though you always know, always already know you're going to fail. And then finally, of course, we have to remember that Elizabeth didn't think that she was a white woman. She thought that she was vain. She thought that she had um, direct linear ancestors who were black. And she was not irrational in thinking that precisely because of the whole climate of sexual violence that is part of enslavement and had been going on on that plantation and others um, since since slaves were first brought to Jamaica. And indeed, even when it appeared to be consenting, she had, she had I mean, her, her father's brother, her favorite uncle had children by an enslaved woman, her brother, her favorite brother also, her second favorite brother also, her brother Sam. So she had first cousins who were brought to England to be educated, um, by, by, their, by the terms of their father's will, because they would have been so discriminated against in Jamaica. I can't imagine they were less discriminated against in Newcastle in England, to be frank, at that time. But, you know, so it was not unreasonable of her. It wasn't some sort of, oh, I, she, wasn't, she wasn't, as we would say now, blacking up. She never, it wasn't a fantasy that she might have been a woman of color. But 
it, alas, I haven't been able to find that she was. I really hoped to. But she certainly thought that she was. And so she was writing against the grain of that internal, internalized racism, as well as internalized sexism all her life. Hope that helps a bit. Thank you so much, Fiona. And, at the, and you brought up such an important set of concerns here for us um, that Alexis, I think you've made us wrestle with, and I continue to wrestle with as I go through your exhibit. Um, we could spend so long on each of these. I think you can see they're so rich. I would like us to make sure that we can move to one more um, exhibit from this section of the exhibition. What is in a face dealing with standards of beauty and personal beauty expected of, of women and how that might show up in Robert Browning's poetry. So I'll go to like to invite Gabriella Aguilar to introduce her exhibit to us. And Gab, um, or Gabriella, I will uh, scroll down as you please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Gabriella Aguilar. And for my piece in the exhibition, I was in the mindset that I really wanted to showcase the way that Elizabeth Barrett Browning went against the typical position for a woman's role during the time period and was much like Professor Sampson mentioned, a pioneer. There was such a high standard in terms of what a woman should look like and how women should act. And I wanted to make Elizabeth a focus piece and connection to modern studies. And in setting out to accomplish this, I ultimately linked my research to the University of Illinois who had created a production of The Body Project to show that the standards, particularly that women face, are still incredibly current in terms of a societal stance. And the bonus was in realizing that it wasn't just Elizabeth Barrett Browning who was very forward thinking, but through the artifacts presented by the Armstrong Browning Library, I discovered that Robert Browning's connections to Coventry and Emily Patmore were eye-opening as well. And Emily Patmore herself, who was often known primarily for her beauty, essentially erased her role as not only a writer, but an editor as well to her husband, Coventry, which was quite similar to the way that Elizabeth and Robert worked together. So it was an absolute pleasure to see a group of seemingly very forward-thinking couples respect one another's work and talent. And my ultimate hope for anyone who views this exhibition is the importance that while many years apart, literature can still reflect our modern times. And I believe you may have touched on this, but I would love it if you could describe one way that through your own research, Elizabeth's life story remains relevant to us now, perhaps primarily in terms with women's roles or, or perhaps how often success is defined by gender versus the work itself. Oh, absolutely, Gabriella. I mean, you know, totally, um, totally to all of it. And, um, you know, I don't know whether you know that Elizabeth absolutely hated being photographed. She was really camera phobic and, you know, it was very difficult. And um, and Robert became very protective of her, her image. I mean, talk about, you know, the image. I mean, we talked earlier about the sonnets to the Portuguese as kind of protecting Elizabeth so she wasn't seen as a kind of fallen woman, a lascivious woman who's run off with her lover and writes love poetry. Um, but they, they were also protecting her literal image so that the, 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 the detail of that photograph you've got, um, the, the McCare brothers photograph, um, which um, I write about in, in the introduction to Two-Way Mirror, I think it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful exemplar of how her reputation was staged and created. Um, you know, there was a Dante Gabriele Rossetti that um, made a made an engraving after it, but he worked with a literal engraver. I mean, a craftsman, and he kept saying, basically, be more be more flattering. But what he was also saying very sweetly was, be more flattering because the original is more flattering. But of course, flattering, who says, you know? Um, so, you know, make her eyes darker, make her hair darker so it doesn't look like it's gray. Um, you know, the original is more charming than, than, you, than you've, 
than you have, you made her in this engraving. So, um, and Robert was very keen for the, the result, which was, is a very attractive image. I think it's attractive because it makes EBB look so feisty. That's what I love about it. But um, Robert was really keen for this image to become the image in North America. And because there was a medallion that was being uh, circulated in reproduction, which was really unflattering and he, you know, he, he couldn't bear it. I think that he couldn't bear it for reasons to do perhaps with masculine pride um, because he was younger than her, he was six years younger than her. And although she looked very young for her age when she was 40, when they got together, she did have a chronic illness and she did age tremendously. Obviously, I mean, she aged so much, you know, her body ran out and she, you know, she died in her 50s. Um, and I think that one of the things that happened in their marriage is that Robert moved from a position where he thought that she wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to make love, they wouldn't be able to have sex, and it would be an, a spiritual union. But of course, she didn't have that attention at all. She wanted, you know, she wanted the whole deal and she wanted to char by him and so on. To, I'm lumbered with this older woman who's too frail to go about. And, you know, frankly, what a drag. Um, but of course, it couldn't be about because she had made him. She had made him financially. She'd made him as a poet, I would say. Um, she had, she had, you know, she was the foremost, certainly the foremost woman poet, but arguably the, one of the two foremost poets in her country. When they went off to Italy, she took this younger, much less published poet with her. She introduced him, you know, everyone came to see her. And then, of course, gradually they came to see him because, you know, she faded and he sort of stepped in front of her. So there was all of this dynamic going on. I find it very dispiriting. I found it very dispiriting how hard it is to persuade um, to get beyond the gender stereotype, I think that, to be frank, I think that um, although the book in this country, it has been very, very hard to persuade male literary editors to get past the fact that she's a lady in a frock and treat her the way they would treat Robert Browning or Tennyson. I mean, a number of places where normally my work is reviewed have not reviewed this book, although, you know, as I say, it's doing great and so on, but, and I know it's because they, I mean, it's explicit, it's because they don't think Elizabeth Barrett Browning is interesting. And they, I'm sorry to say, are always white male, actually, they're not always white, they are male literary editors. They just can't get beyond appearance. Josh? Yeah. Um, yes. Just going to say, um, when I began the introductions, I said it would, was about an hour and a quarter. I realise hour and a quarter is up, but I, I find this so fantastic that I'm reluctant to, to draw it to a close. We've got two more students, I think, still to present. So it's just to say to people, if you're, if you're thinking about the time, do hang on. I, I don't know how you could leave anyway. Um, it's so good, is this? So we've got two more students. Um, and just carry on, please. I think it's wonderful. Thank well, you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, and I, and I agree. I could hardly imagine leaving this really stimulating conversation. And um, and Gabriella, I want to thank you again for this your exhibition, which we've just seen, that I think is um, relevant in so many troubling ways, as Fiona has helped us understand. Um, we'll go to another portion of the exhibition. This is the one relating to nature. And we have one of the students who contributes that portion of the exhibition with us today. We'll be turning to his portion, Ruins Worse Than Rome's, Elizabeth Bear Browning's Fight Against Environmental Inequality. And so I'd like to invite Nicholas Fergesi to um, come on screen for us. And Nicholas, if you wouldn't mind sharing about your exhibit and I will help us see it as well. Sure, sure. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for, for giving us the opportunity to do this. It's been an absolute joy. Um, so my exhibit um, is highly concerned with uh, environmental inequality and particularly what Elizabeth Barrett Browning had to say on the topic. Um, at this point, um, we've, we've laid out that Elizabeth Barrett Browning was a activist, a social activist, an ab abolitionist, and a lot of her work is highly concerned with arguing for the rights um, and freedoms of destitute people groups. Um, 
particularly in this poem that I discuss about, um, that I discuss in this exhibit. Um, it's A Plea for the Ragged Schools of London. It's one of two poems, um, one by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the other by her husband, that were presented at what was basically a fundraising event for these ragged schools, which provided education to uh, poorer children, impoverished children in London. Um, within this poem, there's a specific line that I draw attention to. It's italicized here on the screen. I mean, it reads, princes, parks, and merchants' homes, tents for soldiers, ships for seamen, aye, but ruins worse than Rome's in your pauper men and women. Um, and I think it's very interesting how Elizabeth Barrett Browning isn't just calling out the aristocracy in their opulent homes. She's, she's laying out uh, the different available environments for these different strata of society. Um, in, in, in very much calling attention to that. But at this point, I very much shift and I examine and, and, and kind of uh, point out a disconnect between the words here on in, in Elizabeth Barrett Browning poem and the, the lifestyle she actually lived. Uh, Dr. King, if you would scroll down uh, to the photos at, at the bottom of this exhibit, you'll see uh, two that I'd like to uh, point out. One is a photo from Ibani di Luca, which is a, an Italian retreat, um, basically, where her, Elizabeth Baron Browning, and her husband would vacation during the summer. Um, and another, uh, the very leftmost picture, is the drawing of Hope End, a childhood home um, where EBB stayed until uh, about 1832. And just, just glancing at these, you can tell these are very fine, perhaps not overly extravagant. It's certainly not where the wealthiest members of society would go and, and repose, but it, it, she certainly lived a very comfortable life. And um, I basically want to highlight this disconnect and, and then posit the question of um, should we, basically does the lifestyle she lived uh, discredit the lines of her work? Should we view the work independently of the author and, and just uh, take what it has to say at face value, or should the work be contextualized? In this case, is it discredited almost by the life of the author? Um, and, and this is a question that I've noticed, particularly uh, among uh, my peers. Uh, it was raised in Caitlin and Alexis's presentation today. We're very concerned with this question of authorship, how Elizabeth Barrett Browning's life informed her work, contextualized her work, and perhaps supported or diminished her work. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, I imagine um, that the answer to this question, as the answer to many complicated questions, does not lie on either pole. It's, it's <laughs> find it somewhere in the middle. Uh, but where that middle ground lays, um, I, I, I hope to leave open, hope to leave to contemplation on your end. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I, I would love to ask you, Professor Sampson, um, whether any of the exhibits uh, that myself or my peers have presented today interpreted Elizabeth Barrett Browning's life or work in a way that you found surprising or intriguing, or even on a broader level, as you were doing research for this biography, whether you found yourself reevaluating uh, previously held opinions on Elizabeth Barrett Browning's life and work based on what you found perhaps through your research or on other um, critical analyses that you read. Mm, thank you very much, Nick. Well, so many things spring to mind. I mean, the first thing is that I think that the Rome is a kind of, is about in, in that extract is, is not necessarily so much about the actual, um, you know, the Colosseum and so on. It's about kind of, you know, decadent ruin and so on. And, and the, the, so it's a, as much a metaphorical Rome as an actual Rome. But I think you're but I think you're absolutely right that she's talking about, you know, the whole of society and not just um, her privileged background. I think that we should indeed remember that actually she was the family were inordinately wealthy when she was young. I mean, you know, until her father lost his money, not. I mean, they were so wealthy that even the abolition of slavery, which, of course, happened earlier in Britain, and on British plantations than it did in the States, um, didn't affect um, the family's wealth very much. What affected the family's wealth was a contested will. Um, but even then, they were still extraordinarily wealthy. I mean, but when Elizabeth was, yet, was a child, and until they left Hope End in 1832, when she was 26, I mean, 
they were billionaires by today's standards. I mean, they were extraordinarily wealthy. And it was a new money at a time when, um, you know, money had been traditionally associated with land and place and the British aristocracy in Britain, British aristocracy. Now, suddenly, though, this is the beginning of just the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution is, going to, is coming in. And so there's a new there's beginning to be international trade, obviously like Elizabeth's own family, and there's a new mercantile class, there's a new class of sudden enormous wealth, which isn't vested in land, what in Britain is called old money, um, uh, very dodgily. And Hope End is extremely beautiful. Actually, I live quite near there. That's not where I'm speaking from today, but I live quite near there and it's extremely beautiful. And Elizabeth's father, was so wealthy that he bought the stately home, turned it into a stables, built a huge palatial folly of a house, which you know they lived in until 1832. So, um, so they were very wealthy, and it did her upbringing did give Elizabeth not only a taste for good things in life, but an eye for beauty. Um, now, an eye for beauty isn't necessarily moral turpitude, but it may be. Um, I mean, it's quite touching for me that when I read later Elizabeth, you know, she's when she's writing home to her sisters about Italy, she do, she will describe it in terms of the Malverns. Now, you won't know about the Malverns because you're Americans, but the Malverns are sort of a, a beauty spot, which is not quite as fashionable as it used to be. There are some hills in the west of along the Welsh borders, and they're very nice. But they are not Tuscany, you know, they just aren't. And um, but but Elizabeth had this kind of she charged landscapes with 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 meaning and with affect. And she she did love she did love beautiful. She loved the countryside. I mean, she was a country girl when she was little. She used to ride horses and she was a tomboy and so on. So she was very outdoorsy. So there's all of that around the environment. Of course, the Industrial Revolution just started. So there was no association yet with. Um, environmental degradation, although there is a huge not elephant in the not room, which is the agricultural revolution, which is also playing out all around us. So that's enclosure, moving the peasantry, ab abolishing the British peasantry, forcing them, us in fact, off the land and into to become fodder to be keep, become cheap labor and then indentured labor and so on for the mills and the mines of the that power the industrial revolution and emptying the countryside into gentlemen's parks but also into landowners farms where apparently productivity was was better done but of course that productivity wasn't feeding the farm laborers families because there was it was the end of common grazing and and the whole that whole social infrastructure and that whole way of farming so um as she talks about fields tied up tight, nose with hedges, nosegay like, you know, she thought it was it's very aesthetic, but actually it was it was the hedges were pushing people off the land. So there's that going on as well. And she doesn't really talk about in any political way about that. She sees that the mines and the mills are bad, but she doesn't see the relationship with the landscape that her own family again are in complicity in, in this country, in Britain, leave aside the whole stuff in Jamaica. I think that, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, have to say, I'm hugely, hugely impressed by um, all of your work. I know there's one more student come to come, so this is not, don't worry, these are not concluding remarks, but I mean, in answer to your question, and I love the way that you have so many of you, well, all of you have seized on this kind of, the central problem of, you know, the relationship between a life and a work, which is that, in a sense, we seem to want a writer, we seem to want writing to be a form of authenticity. We want it to be true to some kind of paragon of moral integrity and, and a life to be clean, a kind of, for the life in a sense, to be a, a tabula rasa or a blank page on which the, the work can descend. And of course, actually all work, including great work is made by flawed individuals. You know, some are alcoholics, some are wife beaters, some are just serially unfaithful, some are gamblers, you know, whatever. And some are the descendants of slave owners or, or live in beautiful country parks, which have pushed the desperately impoverished out into, into near starvation. So it's it's really problematic. But art is made by limited human beings, I guess. It's, it sounds simplistic, but I think it's actually quite a profound truth. It is indeed. 
And one might wonder if, if there is some at least residual awareness of that clearing of the land in, in Aurora Lee and Marion and her Rover family. Um, Absolutely. Yes. I mean, a great, great account of rural poverty and, and, and as well as a great account of that changing landscape. Yes. Um, but you're correct. I think one thing that is just consistently revealed by these really, I, I still enjoy seeing these exhibits, um, though having had, you know, seen the students create them, is um, that complex picture it gives us of the Brownings as very much limited, flawed people and yet struggling to make art um, through that. Um, so we have one last section of the exhibit to look at. And one of the students who um, helped contribute to this exhibition was able to join us today. Um, this section has, was focused on the various ways in which the Brownings redefined and renegotiated faith in their time. This section is called, I Never Got to Say Goodbye. And rather than preempting too much of what Jess Marie will share with us, I'll invite her to come on the screen and Jess Marie, I will be happy to take us to places you wish to highlight as you talk. Thank you, Professor King. So the exhibit page I created is important to me because it addresses the pain of losing someone you care for, how you could grieve after losing someone close to you, and how others had such a difficult time grieving that they went to any length to find closure, even if it meant interacting with the medium as Elizabeth did. What I would hope everyone would take away from my page is to consider not just how others cope with the loss of loved ones, but also think if you would have ever received closure in the way that some people in the past did by finding someone who could help you talk to, to the one you've lost one last time. And what I really wanted to ask you, um, Professor Sampson, if you had to say one thing about Elizabeth, Elizabeth Browning that really remains with you from studying her so intensely, what would it be? Oh, Jess Murray, thank you very much. And actually reading your text, it's very um, creative. I wonder whether you're a writer yourself. Yes, I love writing and I love poetry. <laughs> <laughs> you are fantastic. And of course, that is also from, for me, I just think that's, that's wonderful because of course I do, I do want people to love Elizabeth's poetry, even though I think it's uneven as everybody's poetry actually is. Um, you know, I do... I do want people to read her and 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 find the poet in her, you know, and not only think about her life. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think you're absolutely right about um, how important, how desperately Elizabeth wanted to believe in a separation of mind and body, and, and to believe in life after death, you know. And I mean, her family relationship with Christianity was was interesting because on the one hand, they had to be Anglican because that was an established church. With that, you could go to Oxbridge and so on. But of course, her brothers didn't go to Oxbridge, Oxford and Cambridge. They went to Glasgow because they, by that time, they had grown, you know, got to the age to student age. The family had become nonconformist. And that was really quite a big thing to do as, because you have to remember, of course, that Elizabeth's father, Edward Barrett, Malta Barrett, was a foreigner. You know, in Britain and in Britain, in British class society that, you know, among the aristocracy, that will have been really made clear to him. So he, you know, he it mattered to him a lot to become to become a landowner, to to become um, the high sheriff of Herefordshire and so on and to become establishment. But conviction kind of overrode that and he became nonconformist. He started going to prayer meetings and they became worship as a chapel and so on. And obviously low church is much less um, associated with the kind of what one might call the miraculous than high church. And yet at the same time, there was a family interest in spiritualism. And Elizabeth, when she was in Italy, was became very interested in spiritualism because of course she hoped that she could contact her beloved brother but also because she'd lived under the shadow of her own death ever since she was 15. And, you know, she, she, she wanted it to be the case that there was an essential I beyond what she called my horrible vibrating body. She wanted to, she wanted to endure. I mean, arguably and rather patly, one can say, well, she did because um, her writing endures and that is herself, that's her, her inner self, her thinking self. But of course, not also because 
you know, she's not here. So I think that um, I find her, you know, some people find her struggles with, you know, to try and believe in spiritualism and so on. And she did for a while, um, kind of off-putting. I just find them rather touching and sad because they make me feel very protective towards her, which is entirely irrational. But, you know, what's the point of feeling protective towards someone who's great and gone? But, um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, even her beliefs in spiritualism had failed her by the time that she died. And although her last words are supposed to be, you know, about love and beautiful, um, and the deathbed account that Robert gives, because, you know, she died in his arms, is really, really touching. I, we can't be sure that it's true, um, that it's not partly wishful thinking. We can't also be true, incidentally, that if it is, we can't be sure that if it is true, he didn't help her on her way, advertently or not, with an overdose of morphine, you know, because she was using a lot of morphine. She was suffering. She was very poorly. She woke up, you know, he discovered she was, you know, her feet had gone cold. She was, you know, clearly at death's door, you know, it's the classic end of life care thing, you know, how much morphine is too much, you know, we don't know. So there are questions there which have to do with people's beliefs about death and so on. I think that in all the sort of research I've done, what's, I, what I, what I felt more and more is that I haven't come to engage with Elizabeth's unconscious in the ways I did with Mary Shelley. With Mary Shelley, I felt that it really a story about her unconscious and that the amazing creation of Frankenstein kind of coming so, when she's still a teenager, came <clears throat> clearly out of kind of a, a, <clears throat> a convocation of things in her unconscious, to simplify. Elizabeth, to me, seems to be very much a story about conscious self-invention. You know, the quest isn't really for something beyond the self, like God, although she had faces being really quite religious. The quest is for herself. It's a quest for selfhood, which of course is what, you know, she gives us in Aurora Lee too. Aurora Lee's story is the story of Aurora Lee's quest for selfhood is not the quest to become good or the quest to become other than she is. It's, it's the quest to become as I was saying about authenticity to Nick, to become authentically the authentic self who is a writer. Of course, there is no authentic self. We will, I think we're all subjects in process, but <clears throat> there is a, perhaps a work of integration and there is what Milton called that one talent, which is death to hide, not being lodged with us useless, but being allowed to, you know, the poet being allowed to write. And so Elizabeth, for all her social conscience, her political activism and so on, and indeed her very, you know, she was a very, very affectionate family member, a very loving friend and, and, and partner and so on, a mother, doting mother. For her, I think the great quest in life was to try and find ways to become herself. And I don't think we should judge her harshly for that. I think that maybe that's, for all of us, that's part of our duty in life. Mm. I shut up now. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Fiona, and on all of the students for what you've shared with us today. Uh, I've certainly found this so stimulating and enlightening in many ways. See this exhibit that I thought I knew a new, a new light, actually, as a result of this. So thank you. I want to say, I mean, I just think the exhibit is stunning. And I think everything that all the students have said, I mean, I just, it's so interrogative and, and engaged and really exciting. I'm, I'm full of admiration, really. Well, I... I I'm conscious that we, we should end. Um, I don't want to. We've had another question from Anthony Harding, which would introduce Felicia Hemans into the conversation. But sadly, I don't think we've got time for it, but another event, maybe. Um, I just think this has been a wonderful event. I've been, I've been one of the audience, and uh, I've just loved every minute of this. Um, Elizabeth Barrett Brown may not be a romantic, but she's very welcome in our company this evening. <laughs> We're very pleased to have her company and everybody else's company. I just want to thank Hannah as well. Um, I'm going to thank a number of people, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, this is a very busy time for us preparing for the new opening, and uh, Hannah's got a lot to do. 
um, but she's given her time to this for this evening and it's been rewarded. It's been such a special event. So thank you, Hannah, for making it so successful and organizing us so well. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for so scholarly and expertly facilitating the evening and uh, working the, the website as well as speaking and as well as responding and coordinating the students. Fiona, thank you. I loved your introduction. I loved what you, the way you brought through your energy, the vitality and significance of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, a poet for her age, tackling the difficult subjects of the age. And you, you really did, you, you brought her alive for us. So thank you. But I think nothing could have prepared me for that conversation. I think, I think that was uh, just so spontaneous. Um, Fiona, it's fair to say, if you hadn't seen the questions before, um, I thought, uh, I'm going to name you because I want to thank you individually, Bridget, Caitlin, Alexis, Gabrielle, and Nick, Jez Marie. I thought you spoke so well. I think your exhibits are stunning. Um, I think, if I may say, Fiona, I thought your responses just added to it to a whole new level, and it felt like a genuine conversation. I think it did. We, we were just okay. observers um, to to your interaction between you. Um, the topics not comfortable. You know, as we were saying, weren't we? You know, the slavery footprint. Goodness me, that that makes us all uncomfortable. The issues about who has the right to speak on behalf of anybody else. I mean, how many times do we read about that as well? Issues of gender, beauty, and image. I mean, th this was so relevant. Um, this was so interesting. And what you've also done uh, is you saved me a job next time round because when it comes to advice about how do you do an exhibition, well, it's like writing a book, isn't it? You, you seduce the readership or the audience, your scholarship's impeccable, you aim for the general readership, um, you make it relevant for today, and if it doesn't serve your audience, there's no point doing it. So that's job done for the next time you do an exhibition. So, so thank you very much. Um, there's two places to go, isn't there? One's the website when we want to know more, and the other is to buy the book. Um, and I think, Hannah, you, again, you've told us where we can buy the book. So website, book, the next stage forward. Thank you to the audience. Um, it, was, it was worth staying another uh, short period of time. It did, it did repay us. Um, as we often say at the end of these sessions, without the audience, there's no point us doing this. So thank you for being with us and for contributing. If you live locally, if you don't live in Waco or Paris, uh, come and see us. Our, our gardens and outside areas are open. And if you're with a university or, or with anyone, just think what collaboration can do. Come and join us on one of these collaborations because look at that, how successful it is for, for everybody concerned. Um, we've got special events coming, hopefully maybe a Thomas de Quincey event in September. That's the bicentenary of the Confessions, the publication of Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And then hopefully maybe more disparate romantics in the autumn as well. So that's just a, a great event. Forgive my gushing enthusiasm, but I've so enjoyed it. And, and thank you, everyone. And until the next time, good night or good afternoon, I should say. To <laughs> thank you both. Thank you all. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. King. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much, students. Okay. We'll, we'll switch off and, and until the next time. Okay. <laughs>